Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast Russland's uh, uh, Farana. Uh, on this podcast we have already talked about the post-Soviet literature and but today we're going to talk about the the post-Soviet uh, cinema of Russia. Uh, today's guest um, is a postdoctorate uh, at the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, one of her specialities are, of course, uh, Russian cinema. Uh, welcome to the so- show, uh, Irina Anisova. Okay, thank you, Jens, for inviting me. And um, um, yeah, mm. uh, <laughs> you can ask me questions <laughs> about uh, the cinema. Yeah. For Soviet cinema. Yeah. And uh, let us take it from the start. Uh, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, where does the like where does the interest for cinema come from? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's uh, very unexpected for me because uh, originally I was trained as a literature scholar, uh, but then I entered um, the program uh, in the U.S. Uh, um, at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, because I really wanted to focus on contemporary Russian culture. Uh, and uh, one of their strengths was um, post-Soviet film, one of the strengths of the program. Uh, uh, there are two professors uh, who specifically work on Russian film. Um, and uh, they hold, every year they hold uh, so-called Russian film symposium. Um, and so one of these professors was my advisor. And even though I wrote on literature, um, film, basically you couldn't study there without, uh, doing some film, uh, research and some film, uh, practice, <laughs> well, some, uh, film stud- studying film, uh, because there were a lot of classes that you had to take that focused on film. Uh, and uh, I guess my situation is a little bit uh, strange because, um, well, when I entered that program, I didn't realize that, that um, I didn't think about the fact that you have to focus so much on film. And uh, I'm also visually impaired. So for me, it's a little bit strange that I actually became somewhat of a film specialist, even though I wouldn't call myself um, a film scholar. I would describe myself as a cultural scholar and one of my areas is uh, post-Soviet uh, cinema. Hmm. Very interesting. And uh, yeah, for those who doesn't know anything about like uh, Soviet or Russian cinema, like uh, how, d- because yeah, I, of course I know and a lot of Russian knows there's a big difference between uh, Russian uh, post-Soviet and Soviet cinema. But uh, tell us What's the like one of the main different some of the main differences between uh, the post-Soviet cinema and the Soviet one? Mm. Uh, for me, I, I guess uh, uh, would, the biggest difference would be um, ideology, right? Because when uh, during the Soviet time, uh, all films had to be. Uh, run through certain censorship, right? Through certain uh, controls. Uh, so you couldn't make films uh, without uh, state engagement. And uh, basically all uh, directors had to be registered with the state. You couldn't just uh, get a camera somewhere and start making films uh, because uh, you would be actually punished. You would never be able to join the uh, director's profession if you did that. Uh, so the state control and uh, censorship and ideology, uh, so-called socialist realism, um, of course it was more, much more prevalent during Stalin's time, but it still um, kind of uh, was important in, Russia, in, in Soviet films. Um, till the end, because there were a lot of these plots about characters um, kind of reforming themselves, gradually reforming themselves. 
and becoming mod, uh, model Soviet ci uh, citizens um, during the film, even if uh, it, um, it uh, didn't always proceeded uh, straightforwardly. Like, for example, if we, uh, you watch this, uh, Moscow doesn't believe in tears, right? Moscow is mm -hmm. unmediated. So it has this uh, model Soviet citizen plot. Uh, even though actually the film was criticized a lot and was seen as uh, controversial because of some of the elements. But still, the center plot is model Soviet citizen. Uh, so there was uh, this kind of aspect. Of course, there are, there were some art films, art house films. So, so Tarkovsky would be an example, a person who worked kind of outside of the Soviet um, model. But he was allowed to do that because he became a world famous director. So he, we could consider him as an exception. Um, and. Uh, then the post-Soviet films, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, I, I have to say that all this, this, what I'm talking about now, it's always much more complicated, right? Because we cannot talk about Soviet cinema as a whole, right? Because there is a uh, early post-revolutionary cinema, right? Then like Eisenstein, for example. And then there's a Stalinist film. Then there is a saw film, Kino uh, Then there is a kind of stagnation film. And then there is a perestroika film, right? So we have all these distinct uh, periods. And uh, with post Soviet film, there are also distinct periods. I would say the 90s, films of the 90s are very different from 2000s. And now we seem to have a little bit different trend again. Uh, so should I say more about the post-Soviet uh, film, uh, kind of as this uh, three different uh, periods, or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but there's no, uh, because as you have said, there's, you seems to have split like the post-Soviet uh, cinema into three periods, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, for me, I would say that um, this, uh, especially the cinema of the 90s is so different. It's, it was so much about gangster films and the Chernucha films, right? And uh, in gradually in 2000s and now patriotic fil films become much, much more and more important. I think maybe one feature that persists is a, a kind of a split uh, of uh, art house and popular film. Mm. Uh, so there is this kind of uh, some directors who make art house films and some directors who make uh, popular films, and those very rarely inter intersect. Mm. Yes. And uh, yeah, it's uh, but uh, uh... But during Soviet times, you had like these two giant, like which, uh, like uh, Sergei Eisenstein and Andrei Tarkovsky, mm -hmm. who's been, uh, who many consider like the giants in uh, Russian cinema as a whole and Soviet cinema, uh, like uh, uh, Tolstoy and uh, Dostoevsky in literature. But uh, is there any uh, post Soviet uh, directors? Uh, uh, that can consider uh, them that are considered on par with uh, uh, Tarkovsky, for instance. Are there some important directors who are world famous? Mm. Um, world famous, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think it's Zagintsev and Sakurov, but I think Sakurov is mostly for film specialists. Um, and uh, also uh, Balabanov, who I think you have a question about later. <laughs> so you wanted to discuss Balabanov in detail. Uh, but again, um, it's, it's uh, maybe too, too early to talk about uh, who would remain kind of as Tarkovsky or for the post-Soviet time. Uh, as, a, uh, as yourself, as a Western person, how would you, what would, uh, you say who is the most well-known director in the West? 
I think as of now, I think it's uh, uh, Sagintsev, uh, mostly because mm -hmm. of some of his controversial film, like uh, yeah. Leviathan, with won the Golden Golden Prize, and there's like most of his films have been really well received in the West, yeah. especially, and uh, also uh, Sukhorov, who's, uh, mm -hmm. who I consider, who's not as, uh, he's more, way more artist, but I think like, mm -hmm. boil we can boil it down to basically those mm -hmm. two. So you agree with my assessment? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sounds, yeah, sounds good. And uh, yeah, I think Balabanov is really well known in, of course, in Russia, he's extremely popular. And also outside of Russia, also film scholars would probably know Balabanov really well. Yes, because it seems to me that uh, Balabanov, uh, he's not as famous as uh, 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 Svagintsev, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, but uh, I, for me, it seems to me that Balabanov is way more popular in uh, Russia. There's, he seems mm -hmm. to be like a cult uh, director in um, mm -hmm. in Russia, like ones like the film, uh, the the Brat movies, the the brother yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. film is uh, quite popular. Like there's t there's uh, t shirts everywhere. There's uh, his films are quoted all the time and so mm -hmm. on and. Uh, is he kind of is is it appropriate to kind of compare him to calling him like the the Quentin Tarantino of Russia? I think so because I think he was influenced by Tarantino, especially in his later films. Uh, so if we talk about the Kachigar, uh, so the Stalker, and the Gruz Dvesti, the Cargo Two Hundred. Uh, Definitely, the violence of the films kind of suggests uh, kind of Tarantino's influence, and also Me Too, uh, Ya Toja Hachu is another kind of uh, film in this uh, in this style. Uh, I would say actually these films are less popular in Russia, so his later films. Uh, um, uh, very violent films are a little bit less popular than. His earlier films, like you mentioned, Brad, uh, so and Brad Dva, so Brad and Brother Two, are probably the most cult films mm -hmm. in Russia. And I think, uh, especially, uh, the, especially Brother is interesting because it's a very rare example where it's a kind of an art house film, but also a very popular film. Uh, so I think it's unique because, as I said, in post-Soviet film, very often we have this split. Uh, and I think that's why uh, Balabanov is so popular because he managed to cross those two uh, elements um, in this uh, in his earlier film. But uh, I think he became much more art house later, uh, and uh, those films are I would say most people know them, but they are mm, less frequently quoted and discussed. Mm. Yeah, like especially. Like uh, uh, Cargo uh, 200, uh, Gruß 200, that's a very controversial film also. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, I, exactly. I, I even got very turned off by that film. <laughs> because, yeah. so, but, uh, but it's also very uh, interesting because I thought about Tarantino uh, after watching uh, Schmurki. I don't know what's the English, in English title, but uh, it's a... Uh, uh, like there's some parallels there it's about two mm. gangsters who is kind of like samuel l jackson and john travolta but and uh, mm -hmm. th there's also one of the character who is has an obsession with burgers or mcdonald's in this case because, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so yeah and actually uh ya toja Hachu is also interesting because it kind of is in, in a similar way that it's about gangsters but also about this uh a transcendental question. Uh, I don't know if you watched that one. Yes, uh, me, yeah. So that's also maybe a, a little bit similar to Tarantino. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But l let us talk about the. Uh, but uh, which uh, movies are popular? Which Russian movies are popular in Russia itself? Or. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would say in recent time, uh, most popular were comedies, 
uh, which is probably a, a usual thing. Uh, so Gorka uh, and Gorka too is by uh, Krajovnikov. I uh, actually don't know how it's translated into English. Uh, it's about a, a wedding. It's a, com a comedy about a wedding. Uh, and another one, uh, w which was extremely popular last year and collected uh, kind of, it was uh, broke, broke all the records, box office records, was the Halop, the Surf. Um, another comedy about this rich Russian guy uh, who ends up in this imitated uh, Russian village before the emancipation of the Serbs. <laughs> so and that's why it's called the halop. In English, it's called the surf. So it's kind of like the surf in uh, pre, uh, in uh, you know nineteenth uh, century Russia before the emancipation. And he actually believes that he ended up in this village somehow and uh, is reformed <laughs> and falls in love. <laughs> because of this. So he was a, this very spoiled uh, rich boy and becomes a good person through this experience. So you can see it's kind of very, uh, I would say very superficial still, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it was extremely popular. And there are some funny, funny, funny elements in that film, I would, ha I would have to say. Mm. Yes, because like... Uh... It seems like uh, the only thing, the only movies that sells, Russian movies that sells in the West are the ones that are sad ones or like uh, are critical of the government, like uh, Leviathan, the uh, Le 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 Leviathan in English. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, why uh, why is that? That it's mostly the the sad and uh, melancholic Russian film that is. Uh, winning prices and so on and uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, so there are several explanations. There, uh, there is an official Russian explanation, uh, the government explanation, and they always accuse um, Russian directors that they kind of play to the West, that they they are sellouts, right? Because they want to sell this. Uh, kind of russophobic message to the West, uh, which uh, probably, of course, I mean, I disagree with this interpretation. Uh, but um, because it keeps on happening, then uh, they, there is this kind of self-fulfillment in a way that, okay, Russian government says that, and this is exactly what is happening. Uh, West is buying <laughs> these uh, uh, anti -ru well, ru Russian movies that represent Russian reality as kind of sad. Um, but I think the reason why it's happening, usually these are really good films, actually. Like Leviathan, I think, is a very interesting film. And they are artistically more interesting. Mm. Uh, and also they, of course, touch on some very uh, important problems and they become kind of a festival successes. It's not that, well, some of these films do cross to, um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say they become kind of popular, right? Um, and uh, break the uh, box office. But because uh, the festival public is looking for these serious films and artistically complex films, then usually those are the films that represent Russia uh, in a negative, somewhat negative way. Hmm. So that's my explanation. Yeah, it seems uh, it seems that way, and uh, yeah, and uh, but uh, yeah, like but uh, uh, of course, officially in our Russia, the Russian Federation is a. Uh, a free country with uh, where with the freedom of the press and freedom of expression, and uh, but uh, of, and uh, of course there's no uh, like censorship officially as I understand. But I remember back in 2014 when uh, Leviathan was uh, uh, the Leviathan was released uh, that uh, there was some censorship in some uh, 
Russian cinemas. And uh, but how is the situation with uh, censorship uh, in movies mm -hmm. in Russia right now? So of course there is no censorship like in the past, like in the Soviet Union when uh, there were actually official office of kind of censor office where after you make the film you have to go there and actually it was the same for newspapers so there were all sorts of uh, censorship offices so this was kind of official now of course there is no such thing as a censor uh who you know people who work as the censors um but uh, at the same time there are two ways in which uh, we can see kind of uh not censorship per se, but it's uh, attempts to regulate uh, production of films. So one is economic, because the state uh, favors um, basically patriotic films and gives money for those projects. There is such an organization, as call, uh, it's called uh, Fond Kino, uh, and so they uh, distribute money to directors and uh, they prefer historical dramas or patriotic films, or, or even better if it's both, <laughs> mm. combination of historical and patriotic, or, you know, films about sports, successes of, in sports. Um, and uh, then also it's the distribution. So for example, some films are denied distribution uh, and then they are not shown in, in, in cinemas, in, in theaters, and then nobody knows about those films because they are not distributed. So actually, this, uh, you mentioned Livia Fan, so it, was, uh, it, it faced some of those problems. Uh, but actually, there is another case where it was even more extreme. There was um, uh, a film by a Chechen director uh, and it was uh, completely denied distribution. The film is called uh, Order to Forget, Chicago and um, And uh, that was, uh, yeah, the, the film wasn't, wasn't distributed at all. Hmm. So that's kind of the, the point is that you can make uh, whatever film uh, you want, but it's, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't matter as uh, if it's uh, denied distribution. That is, the, that yeah. Yeah. Also, if you need to get money first to make the film, and if uh, for some directors they uh, can find uh, funding themselves, they can find sponsors. For example, Zvagintsev, uh, he could find sp uh, sponsors for his films. Uh, actually, it's funny. Lydia Fan did have some state support. Uh, because I, I think they didn't read the script very carefully or something. But um, for some other directors, young directors, might be very difficult to find funding. Yeah. But uh, like films about uh, homosexuality, for instance, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, out of the question. Really. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, actually in 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 two thousand there were some films that touched on the subject, but now I think it would be very difficult to make this kind of film. Mm -hmm. Of course. And um, one last question: uh, What is the future of the Russian cinema? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit sad right now. <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. we don't know. Uh, so I, I'm afraid that um, there will be a kind of uh, a, a difficult entry point for younger directors uh, who want to make an independent film. Uh, but also I think uh, we can see now that uh, there are some online projects uh, and uh, also some uh, platforms like, uh, similar to Netflix that are opening in Russia, for example, for example, Kinopoisk, and they make some interesting uh, TV series. For example, Photopia is a recent example. I haven't seen this uh, TV series, and I actually want to subscribe to one of those uh, platforms to see how it works. So hopefully, uh, 
there will be this independent uh, platform and uh, project, and maybe they can sponsor production of some interesting film. Mm -hmm. Because it's a uh, Kina it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's independent. It's not then state funded. Yeah, those are commercial projects. But of course, you know, the state always wants to control the internet and always wants to control, like Yandex, you probably heard how this, mm -hmm. uh, Yandex used to be independent, but then became state controlled pretty much. Or of contact, yes, is another example. Mm, but usually the state is not so, it doesn't have, it has limited resources. So it's hard for, for the government to control everything, at least right now. So there is hope for, um, for some independence in, in, in this uh, platform. Yeah, because I think that most Russian officials know that censorship in the end doesn't work. They learned it from the Soviet area. So, but yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... yeah they, they learn to be smarter about <laughs> these things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, oh. but yeah, but uh, I think that uh, was it. Uh, it was an interesting conversation and I ho hope people learned a lot about the, the post-Soviet cinema. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Irena, for coming thank on the show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and uh, like a last one, last thing. Could you uh, do you have some uh, movie recommendation of some new newer films? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like uh, Balogov uh, um, Builder. Uh, so, but it's again a, an example of very sad <laughs> <laughs> and uh, disturbing film. Um, I also like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid, yeah, now we'll tell uh, people all, uh, I mean, Balabanov, of course, like you mentioned, is mm -hmm. always interesting to watch for people who are not familiar with um, Russian films. Uh, actually, one very interesting uh, phenomenon that is happening right now is Dao Project. Um, have you heard about this? No, what uh, is that? By Herzhanovsky. Dow Project is uh, basically, um, it's kind of a reality TV meets uh, films about Stalinism. Um, so it's by this director Herzhanovsky. Uh, and um, he made uh, this project where he kept the actors uh, for, for a couple of days, for, for a couple of years. Uh, living in, of course, they came, um, left and came back uh, in this specially designed, uh, um, a kind of restricted institute, which imitated the 1950s, life in the 19, 1950s. Mm. Um, and then, so he recorded uh, a lot of uh, this material, and now uh, he released around, I would say, by now, maybe 20 films out of all this, uh, <laughs> out of this, all this filming time. Uh, so uh, he had, um, actually in Bergen, we have seen one of the films from this project. It's called Down Natasha. Um, and so it's um, again about life in this institute uh, of these uh, two women who are uh, workers, kind of a buffet or uh, container workers mm -hmm. in this institute. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's very special uh, and uh, not everybody would like it, uh, but uh, it's very, very interesting project. Mm -hmm. Very unusual. Yeah, the down uh, movies. Yeah, yeah. down film, yeah, by Harjanovsky. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah, that's uh, some good uh... A uh, good recommendation there, but I think we have to wrap it up. And uh, thanks uh, once again for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.